John L. Vakia was an influential American journalist and ufologist who is best known as the author of the Mothman Prophecies. Keel was born on March 25, 1930. His parents separated and he was raised by his grandparents in the nearby town of Perry. As a child, he read insatiably. He remembered himself as a reading machine, especially anything about illusion, humor, science, travel, and aviation. He had his first story published in a magician's magazine at the age of 12. By the time he was 14, he was determined to be a writer. He wrote a column scraping the keel for the Perry Herald, publishing his own science fiction fanzine, The Lunarite, and routinely sending out submissions to magazines. He left school at the age of 16 after taking all the science courses. In 1947, at the age of 17, he hitchhiked to Manhattan, or more specifically, Greenwich Village. He became associate editor of the quarterly magazine Poets of America, and editor of the weekly newspaper Limelight. At this time, he was also writing for comic books, contributing poetry to various magazines, turning out scripts for early TV stations, and authoring many pulp articles. He also wrote scripts for radio shows, including Grand Central Station and First Nighter. When he was 18, he was said to have had a strange illumination experience in his furnished room off Times Square. He remembered the room filled with an indescribable light, a pinkish glow, and his mind flooded with a torrent of information. In 1951, he was drafted. He served in the U.S. Army during the Korean War on the staff of the American Forces Network at Frankfurt, Germany. After leaving the military, he worked as a foreign radio correspondent in Paris, Berlin, Rome, and Egypt. Some of his programming ideas, a remote broadcast from the Great Pyramid and another from Frankenstein's castle, earned him a great deal of publicity. In 1954, he was restless and determined to see more of the world. He spent the next year wandering through the Middle East in Egypt and India, investigating the Indian rope trick and the legendary Yeti. He supported himself by sending back stories and articles to his agent, who then placed them in men's adventure magazines. In Singapore, he was deported as an adventurer and moved to Barcelona, where he turned his experiences into the book Jadu. He published Jadu in 1957 and moved back to New York City, promoting it by performing with cobras in the window of the Midtown Aquarium at Times Square, and with many TV and radio appearances. Then he edited the magazine Echo. Funk and Wagnall also hired him as a science and geography editor. In the 1960s, he worked a great deal in television and turned out many scripts for TV shows and animated series. In 1966, he was commissioned to write an article on unidentified flying objects. He was determined to write the definitive article on the subject. Keel became hooked on the subject of UFO and began conducting his own field research. He traveled around the country interviewing witnesses and writing dozens of articles. The phenomenon, he learned, took its toll on its investigators. He entered a shadowy world where black cars vanished on country roads, meaningless messages turned up in hotel rooms, and his phone and mail suffered strange interceptions. Influenced by writers such as Charles Fort, he began contributing articles to Flying Saucer Review and took up investigating UFOs and other strange sightings as a full-time pursuit. He concluded that a disproportionate number of sightings occurred on Wednesdays. After hearing about the Scarberry Mallet Mothman sighting, he made repeated visits to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, then the site of a particularly active monster and UFO sightings. Reports of paranormal activity was overtaking the small town of Point Pleasant throughout 1966 and 1967, resulting in Keel adopting that area as his own research microcosm. As it turned out, Keel would not be disappointed with his selection of Point Pleasant. The result was one of his most popular books, The Mothman Prophecies. Upon arriving at Point Pleasant, Keel soon found strange coincidences and phenomenon would follow him wherever he traveled. He would find the same thing to be happening with many witnesses of the strange creature that was later dubbed The Mothman. Keel stayed in contact with some of the eyewitnesses for many years, 
and would frequently travel back to Point Pleasant from his home in New York City to conduct more investigations. Keel himself never had a run-in with the infamous Mothman, but he would often see strange lights over the town. Keel then became a technical advisor to the Library of Congress and special consultant at the Office of Scientific Research in the Bureau of Radiology, before becoming a consultant to the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. He also fulfilled a boyhood dream by earning his pilot's license. Along the way, he put out a lively newsletter, Anomaly, which spanned 11 issues from 1969 to 1974. He also wrote a regular column for Saga and published several books. In 1970, he released his study of UFOs entitled Operation Trojan Horse. That same year, he also put out an encyclopedia of monsters entitled Strange Creatures from Time and Space, which included a chapter on West Virginia's Mothman. Keel then released Our Haunted Planet in 1971. In 1975, he published his book, The Mothman Prophecies. The book was Keel's account of his experiences in Point Pleasant, and his investigations into sightings of the huge winged creature called the Mothman. The book combined Keel's accounts of receiving strange phone calls with reports of mutilated pets, and culminates with the December 15, 1967 collapse of the Silver Bridge in West Virginia across the Ohio River. Keel's follow-up book, The Eighth Tower, was released in 1975. The book was comprised of reworked material that was left out of the Mothman prophecies and delves further into Keel's ideas and possible explanations. In the 1980s, he attempted a number of plays and novels. He devoted his time to various mail-order projects and revived the dormant New York Fortean Society. He contributed a regular column to Fate magazine entitled Beyond the Known. Our next guest is a Fortean, and we'll find out exactly what that is from him. He is also the editor-in-chief of Pursuit magazine. Welcome, please, John Keel. So you're a Fortean, eh? Oh, well, I've been trying to outgrow it. Actually, uh, What is a Fortean? Uh, it's spelled F-O-R-T-E-A-N. What is that? Uh, back in the early part of the century, there was a man named Charles Fort who spent his entire life in the New York Public Library mm -hmm. going through the old scientific journals and old newspapers. And he published a series of books about strange things that turned up in these old journals like uh, when it would rain frogs in France or r red snow in Switzerland. He kept track of all these things, did a series of books, and we started calling these events 14 events. I see. And today we still keep track now, of Now, the two examples you cited there, I have, uh, I've heard of raining the frogs, and, it, and it's always a matter of, it's either one an old wives' tale. Uh, remember the yeah. time it rained wives' tales? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, uh, or it's... Uh, disputed in some, they could just say, well, there were frogs in the trees. When it rained, they jumped out. <coughs> well, we have compiled a list of several thousand mysterious things that have fallen from the sky. They uh, documented things. They include things like stone pillars, cannonballs, uh, all kinds of strange things. In China, it once rained raw meat. No, and, uh, no. There, there's no explanation. When, when in China did it rain raw meat? Well, quite a while ago. It was in the 19th century. Now, how is but it that all the unexplained things took place in the 19th century oh, or before? Oh, they're still taking place. Give me a recent unexplained all thing, right, other uh, than Amazing Al. Every, <laughs> every January and February, here in the Northeast, we have what we call skyquakes. They get into the papers sometimes. Now, recently, they've been blaming the Concord for this. But this has been going on. We've been keeping track of this since uh, about 1840. What is a skyquake? It's an explosion in the sky. We have no explanation for it. We've got a lot of pseudo explanations. Well, how do we know when we hear one or see one? Because it's like when a jet, a jet plane passes over at, uh, you know, uh, Mach 2. It's like uh, breaking the sound barrier. It's an explosion that shatters, sometimes shatters windows and so on. And uh, this has been going on in, in Connecticut, for example. The Indians had legends about this going way back. So this has been going on for a very long time, but every time it happens, the scientists come up with a new far-fetched explanation for it. What is the, um, the most common or, or, or daily unexplained occurrence? I mean, something that we would all say, yeah, that's that thing. We can't explain it. What? Well, we don't necessarily have daily occurrences, but uh, in recent years, we, the UFO phenomenon has been very common around the world. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's going on in Argentina. And uh, while a lot of people think they have an explanation for it, uh, actually, we're just beginning to find out uh, what's really going on with the UFO phenomenon. UFOs are, are pretty much, I would guess, if we asked the audience, I, we'd probably find over half of them said, yeah, they have reason to believe there's something going on out there, I think. At, at least 10% of them have probably seen one themselves. Has anybody here ever seen one of these things? People applaud if you've seen one. Yeah. Um, 
and, and, and how many of you think there may be something visiting us? What other things uh, fall into the category of unexplained phenomena? Well, we have mysterious animals that turn up all over the world. Like what? Here in the United States, uh, every year or two, we have kangaroos uh, jumping around Illinois, Connecticut, various parts of the United States. We know there are no kangaroos here. The police go out and chase them, shoot at them. They disappear. We never... So what is, your, what is your theory? Where do you think they're coming from? The same place that the dinosaurs are coming from, because we have dinosaurs turning up every uh, couple of years. Uh, about 10 years ago in Italy, the uh, Italian army turned out to chase a dinosaur in the mountains of Italy, northern Italy. And uh, they leave dinosaur footprints, and that's the end of them. They, they can't find any, where, they, uh, where they've been, <laughs> where they've gone. Um, uh, we've, we've got better monsters than that. We've got our sea serpents, which we have several lakes in the United States that have sea serpents, not just Loch Ness. And well, where is a, a serpent in this country? A Lake Champlain in New York State. Really? What H is up Henry there? Henry Hudson, who was the first to go up there, reported seeing Henry Hudson and his crew saw a sea serpent in Lake Champlain, and every year somebody sees it up there. And nobody has yet organized an expedition to go up there and really look into it. Well, what's you they organize drive up there? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go up there next week. We'll take weekend. the Italian yeah. army with us. We'll get those boys and... Uh, <laughs> Um, have we ever photographed a sea serpent? Well, the one in Loch Ness has been photographed any number of times. Yeah. Uh, movies have been made of it. Uh, and the movies have been examined by the RAF and other specialists. And they're obviously some kind of large animal that's living in Loch Ness. Now, this, uh, what do we have here? This, uh, this is a plaster cast of a, of a big footprint. Now, you've all heard of the abominable snowman in the Himalayas. Uh, we have in the United States, we have a creature that's variously called Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And he's found not just in Washington and Oregon, but he's found all over the United States, especially in the Mississippi Valley. And even in New Jersey, we have quite a lot of reports out of New Jersey, and that's where this footprint comes from. This is from, to you, from Uncle Lou and Bob. <laughs> that's what it says here. <laughs> there are two Fortians in uh, New Jersey. Now, and this, made, uh, this is an authentic footprint. Did you make the cast? No, they, they did. They're, they, they're well-known Fortians. Uh -huh. Bob is an airlines pilot, and Uncle Lou is a, a dental surgeon in New Jersey, and they're, they're very active. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. It just sounds well, funny. Uh, dental uh, surgeons make good casts. Uh, what, how big would this guy be based on this foot? He would be about 800 pounds, probably uh, eight or nine feet tall. Mm. And that's what the witnesses are always describing, incredible as it is. And in, of course, the Himalayas, the abominable snowman. Uh, now that, I, I think, uh, that uh, we believe in, or at least I do. To me, it seems like, sure, it's possible that something left over that survived the Ice Age or didn't survive there or something, you know, that there may be a missing link and so on and so forth. Some of this other stuff, like the red snow, wh what was the red snow? Well, the usual scientific explanation for that is that the uh, sands of the Sahara are somehow drawn into clouds and... Uh, drop in Switzerland. Now, I can believe that. Except there are no red sands in, in the Sahara Desert. And I've well, spent what if part of my life on the what Sahara. What if the sand went up and was somehow oxidized or and turned red? Isn't that well, a Well, they, they've made various chemical analysis of this kind of snow. We've had black snow, too. Good yellow and snow. I'm yeah, familiar with that. Snow. <laughs> I think we were all waiting for that one, weren't we? Yes. Um, uh, the, we, we just don't know what what really causes this phenomenon. Uh, the, the sand explanation doesn't work. Is there one in particular that keeps you awake at night, that just gnaws at you? Well, there's some frightening things going on, yeah. Like what? Uh, what the, are we scared of here? The animal mutilations that have been going on around the country, uh, especially uh, out west in recent years. But they're also going on in Brazil and France and Australia and Switzerland, Sweden. And these are not pranks or sick no. uh, jokes? Th thousands of animals have been slaughtered now by some mysterious group. Uh, they drain all the blood from the animals. And uh, they also perform expert operations on the animals, removing certain organs. And uh, veterinarians who have examined these animals say they can't duplicate the operations. That's amazing. I would also like to know why cab drivers in the city don't speak English, but we'll never figure that one out. Uh, we have to pause. Mr. John Keel, a Fortean, ladies and gentlemen. Edwin Newman will be with us. He also released another book, Disneyland of the Gods, in 1988. He then did a revised version of his book, Strange Creatures from Time and Space, 
entitled The Complete Guide to Mysterious Beings in 1994. Keel lived for many years in the Upper West Side of New York City. In his later years, he was slowed down considerably by diabetes and its complications. He had some lean times, particularly when cataracts and the resulting eye surgery made writing difficult. His luck turned around when the Mothman Prophecies was made into a major motion picture in 2002. He was particularly delighted at being portrayed by Richard Gere, whom he jokingly referred to as a John Keel look-alike. The publicity sparked several new editions of the book, including numerous foreign editions. He bought a car, which he dubbed the Mothmobile, and often disappeared on solo road trips. He attended the 2003 Mothman Festival in a white suit, and was there for the unveiling of the Mothman statue. In 2006, he released The Best of John Keel, which was a collection of his Fate Magazine articles. With age, his health declined, and he spent several years in and out of hospitals and nursing homes. His friends pitched in to keep him going. He died on July 3, 2009. Many friends visited him in his various hospitals and homes. His papers were saved by his friends and family. Prolific and imaginative, Keel is considered a significant influence to many. His impact cannot be underestimated, especially in terms of his analysis of patterns. The popular cultural influence of Keel has been enormous. It will take future academic studies to fully realize his reach among the subcultures that respect and are denizens of his ongoing intellectual playground. John Keel popularized the term Men in Black, introduced the acronym MIB, and coined the term Ultra-Terrestrial. He had many interesting ideas attempting to explain the nature of the odd things that people often report to see. John Keel strongly disagreed with the extraterrestrial hypothesis for unidentified flying objects. In other words, he did not think that UFOs are from other planets and was completely against this notion. He instead posited his own term for what they might be, and his own hypothetical explanations for where they come from. He thought that UFOs might enter our world from another dimension. Keel analyzed what he called window areas, or zones of fear, which he viewed as ways in which strange otherworldly entities and creatures could enter our world. He favored this explanation for Mothman. He thought there were certain places of high strangeness in the world where these windows opened up and let in visitors. He coined the term ultra-terrestrials to describe these beings. He described them as trickster beings or cosmic pranksters, here to play simple-minded games with simple-minded humans. He's quoted as saying, From time to time, the playful inhabitants of the other world climb through the curtain in areas we call windows, and they stalk us to drink our blood and create all kinds of mischievous beliefs and misconceptions in our feeble little terrestrial minds. He's also quoted as saying, This planet is haunted by us. The other occupants just evade boredom by filling our skies and seas with monsters. He wrote about these ideas in his 1975 book, The Eighth Tower. This is a hypothetical spectrum of energies that are known to exist but cannot be accurately measured with present day instruments. Kill continues. This super spectrum is the source of all paranormal manifestations. It is extra dimensional. John Keel considered what others thought of as different phenomenon to all be one and the same, or at least connected. The following is a list of John Keel's books. Jadoo, 1957. Strange Creatures from Time and Space, 1970. Operation Trojan Horse, 1970. Our Haunted Planet, 1971. The Mothman Prophecies, 1975. The Eighth Tower, 1975. Disneyland of the Gods, 1988. The Complete Guide to Mysterious Beings, 1994, which is a revised version of Strange Creatures from Time and Space. The Best of John Keel, 2006, which is a collection of John Keel's Fate Magazine articles. The following are books of John Keel's selected writings. Flying Saucer to the Center of Your Mind, 2013, a collection of John Keel's magazine articles and lectures edited by Andrew Colvin. The Outer Limits of the Twilight Zone, 2013, Searching for the String, 2014. The Book of Mothman, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Reality Distortion But Were Afraid to Ask, 2015. The Invisible Diet, Top Secret Techniques for Turning Your Miserable Life Completely Around, 2015. The Great Phonograph in the Sky, 2015. The Passionate Persipent, Illusions I Have Known and Loved, 2015. How to Investigate UFOs and Other Insane Urges, 2015. Anomaly, the Irregular Newsletter, edited by John Keel, Collection of Newsletters, 2016. Pursuing the Addenda, Supernatural Reports from the Natural World, 2016. The Unknown is out there. The universe does not exist as we think it exists, and we don't exist as we think we exist. Belief is the enemy.